continue to join us. <clears throat> Good afternoon, all. This is Doug Scutchfield. Uh, uh, I am the uh, co-principal investigator of the at the National Coordinating Center, and my colleague, uh, Dr. Glenn Mays, is uh, uh, the pr principal investigator on this, and the two of us will be leading over the next several weeks uh, some phone calls, but I wanted to take the opportunity to express uh, our thanks and appreciation for folks who are coming on to this and to our presenters for their willingness to assume responsibility for uh, bringing us up, up to speed in terms of the research that's ongoing. I would say that these, uh, these initial ones are our Mentored Research Scientist Awards our equivalent of the K Awards with the notion of beginning to move uh, uh, our more senior junior individuals on to independent status in terms of their research uh, capacity and that uh, we have, uh, I think, one of our best to, to get us started. Uh, today, uh, I can have the next slide, Kara. Uh, today, we're going to be joined by two folks uh, who are going to be talking about racial disparities and access to public water and sewage service. Uh, and our two colleagues who are joining us are, are the recipient of our uh, grant, Dr. Jacqueline Gibson. Uh, Dr. Gibson holds uh, dual doctoral degrees uh, from Carnegie Mellon in engineering and public policy. Uh, and has an MS degree in civic, civic, civil and environmental engineering at Illinois Champaign and an, and an undergraduate degree in math from Bryn Mawr. But She's already written a book worked on her, based on her work uh, on, uh, in the UAE and has published a substantial number of peer-reviewed articles and is already a PI on two uh, health impact uh, uh, projects. She is mentored by a distinguished colleague from uh, from the UK, the other UK, I guess I should say, uh, Jim. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, professor Bartram is uh, a professor at the University of North Carolina <coughs> who has been with the World Health Organization for a substantial uh, period of time and has uh, enjoyed an international reputation working with water and water supply and sanitation problems in developing countries. Uh, I don't have to tell all of you that in point in fact, uh, environmental health is one of the major issues that public health departments have to deal with. In point of fact, uh, the second most common individual employed by a health department after the public health nurse is the sanitarian. And those of you who have had experience in practice, I'm sure, have dealt with the angry developer with whom you have been working regarding the uh, percolation of the soil in which he wants to put a development with more houses than you're willing to allow. So uh, it's, it's a source of, as many of you know, contention uh, in our issue of public health. It has been generally neglected, unfortunately, I think, in PHSSR, and I think we are pleased uh, at the National Coordinating Center to have this project because it is an important, uh, an important project in that regard. Uh, if I can have the next slide, please, Kara, just briefly. And that is, I wanted to, before I get, turn, it, uh, turn it over to Jackie and Jamie, uh, to uh, indicate that the next future calls uh, will include the, are on these dates, January 22nd, February 5th, and February 12th, and we hope that you will mark those on your calendars. These are all mentored research project, mentored scientist research projects, and you can see the three that will remain that deal with tuberculosis, uh, public health data, and its shared and use uh, uh, arrangements, and the use of social media in public health. And all the calls will be from 12 to 1 uh, Eastern time. Um, if you have any question about these, and again, Kara, next slide. 
you can get a hold of me or you can get a hold of Ann, who really runs the place, the brains of the outfit, uh, and her uh, information is, is here. Uh, <clears throat> with that, <clears throat> let me take the opportunity to turn the, uh, the ball, if you will, the ability to advance the slides over to, uh, uh, to our colleagues today uh, from North Carolina. Uh, we are, we've asked them to present, and then we will uh, get up for questions. So, uh, Jackie and Jamie, you guys are on. Hey, terrific. Um, well, this is Jackie, and I'll get started. So, as Scott said, um, this project, for which we're really grateful to uh, uh, folks for funding, concerns racial disparities in access to public and water, water and sewer service in North Carolina. And uh, this is a project very much in progress. And so today I'm going to be giving a lot of background information and kind of describing our data collection process and then just giving some preliminary results. Um, but the overall objectives of the project are to basically find communities in North Carolina that are on the fringes of cities and towns, often within a stone's throw or even next door to public water and sewer plants, but don't have public water and sewer service, and generally a reliance on septic systems and wells, many of which are failing. Um, and the second objective is to characterize what the health risks might be in these communities of their lack of being connected to the public services. Um, and the third is to identify what are, have been the factors that have kind of led to this situation where we have people that are living very close to uh, public water and sewer treatment facilities but don't have access, and what, what might we be done, particularly um, by public health departments, to try to begin to fix this issue. And so, as I mentioned, I'm going to talk, give a lot of background at the start. Why, why did we get interested in pursuing this line of research? Um, what's the previous evidence that these kinds of disparities might exist? Then I'm going to talk uh, a little bit more detail about the scope of our project, in, um, meaning kind of which populations are we including and which ones are we not including in analysis. I'll talk, a, a lot of this project really is about gathering new data, and so I'm going to talk about that. And then, as I said, I'll, I'll give some preliminary results with the big caveat that we're about midway through the project so far, and so these results are very preliminary. Um, so what's the previous evidence of these disparities? Well, on this slide, I'm showing a map that was previously developed by an organization called the Cedar Grove Institute. It's a nonprofit organization here in North Carolina. And it has documented uh, a few communities around the state where we have situations where predominantly African-American communities are basically zoned out of municipal services. So, this map here is one that they prepared, and um, the, the levels of shading basically show the percent African American in the census blocks, and the um, basically the, the areas with cross hatching here, those are within city boundaries. Um, and what you'll see, the red lines are the city boundaries, and then there's these networks of green lines that basically show um, sewer service, and um, what you, you can't see particularly well on this small version, but a lot of the red lines of the city go right around these minority neighborhoods. Here's an example. Can everybody see me kind of moving around the slide there? Okay. Um, well, these people, if they're right next to a very dense network of water service in a, in a non-minority community of sewer service, but they don't have service. And this particular community, actually, um, is located right next to a very wealthy golf resort. And this situation is so stark that it actually was picked up by the New York Times in 2005. So there was a big article in the New York Times in 2005 talking about these communities. The U.S. Open was about to come to Pinehurst, North Carolina. Here's a picture of Pinehurst. And reporters found out that there are communities right next to Pinehurst, here's a picture from one of them, that have absolutely no city services, no water service, no sewer service, no trash collection, not even paved roads. Um, and they're right here next to, you know, this very, very wealthy area. So there's one example of the three communities that were kind of documented by 
Cedar Grove Institute, work of the Cedar Grove Institute. There's another community, it's right here in Chapel Hill. It's less than four miles from our campus at UNC, less than four miles from my office here. And this community, I'm showing on the map here, it's, it's bounded in red and kind of shaded in light yellow. Um, it has been a predominantly African-American community for about 150 years. Um, and for just about, well, for all of that time, most people, in, well, most people in the community have lacked water and sewer service. In 1972, Orange County, where Chapel Hill is located, decided to put its landfill right next to this community. So here's a picture of the landfill. The landfill is literally right in the backyards of several homes. You can actually see it from their backyards. I've been there. Um, when the landfill was built, the community really protested its construction, and the, the mayor of Chapel Hill, who was the very first African-American mayor, actually said to the community, well, we're only going to leave it open for 10 years, and as compensation, you will get paved roads, water service, sewer service, and a community center, and after it's closed in 10 years, we'll make it into a park. Well, soon enough, water lines were run out to the landfill, and you can see these light blue lines here. Here's the landfill. But the, the communities themselves were not actually ever connected. The, the homes weren't connected to the water lines. And so they remained without water and sewer. Within the last few years, some homes have been able to get connected, but for a very high fee that most people can't afford. Um, so there's another example right here in Chapel Hill. Um, what other evidence do we have that these disparities might exist? Well, my practice mentor for this project is Dr. Jeff Engel. Unfortunately, he couldn't be on the line because he had a board meeting today. But he was the, the North Carolina Public Health Director um, up until a, our, our new governor came into office. And um, he had learned of this problem fairly early in his, his term as Public Health Director and had asked uh, he had heard these anecdotal reports of communities like Pinehurst, this neighborhood in Chapel Hill, and a couple of others that have been documented. So he asked all the county health directors to go out and do some field surveys and document locations where this kind of situation was arising, basically where there were African-American communities located in very close proximity to public services but didn't have water and sewer service. And I'm showing here just two rows of the spreadsheet that documents the information that he got back from the public health directors. These are for two counties, Cleveland County and Lincoln County. And as you can see, what the second column shows is basically the public health director's estimate of the number of communities in that county who might be in this situation. The third column is the estimated number of homes. You'll see here for Cleveland County, the estimate is blank because the public health director really has no ideas no idea how many homes are affected. The last two columns really describe the need. So you'll see here for Cleveland County, the county health director found homes with privies, straight pipes, meaning straight piping sewage directly into streams uh, without any treatment, failing drain fields in septic systems, incomplete plumbing, uh, lots of evidence of clusters of homes with failing septic systems. Um, and so this kind of situation, the county health directors documented in a, in a number of counties. But like I said, what you'll notice is there was missing information. So we go on to this next slide. And out of all 100 counties, 39 of the 100 health directors replied to Dr. Engel's request. And for only 24 of the 100 counties in North Carolina did the health directors come up with an estimate of how many homes might be uh, affected and so and those those estimates really are kind of just based on the judgment of the health director not on any kind of systematic analysis so as you'll see there's a lot of anecdotal evidence of these kinds of disparities in service but not complete a complete data set that would really allow us to understand how big this problem is and what the health risks might be so what might be the health risks here on this slide I'm showing again a quote from uh, Cleveland County's health director that there's these clusters of homes with failing septic systems. At the same time, there are clusters of homes with a known history of poor quality water in their wells with foul odors, foul colors, uh, and so on. And so what are the risks? Obviously, if people have a private well in close proximity to a failing septic system, that is very bad news from a public health perspective. Like 
preventing exposure to human fecal contamination is really the first line of defense in public health. And here this lower picture shows a picture like of a, of a cracked well. And obviously these homes with failing septic systems are really at risk that their, their water source could become contaminated with uh, both human pathogens and with chemical contaminants. But again, we really don't understand the magnitude of this risk. But evidence from the community that I mentioned in Chapel Hill really suggests that there might be risks. Um, in this community, a previous group of UMC researchers did a septic system survey, and this shows the results of the survey. About 22% of the septic systems were not compliant with, with maintenance and design standards. 27% were actually shown to be completely failing. 4% were in need of maintenance. So there were really high rates of septic systems, septic system failures documented in this particular community. The same group also did tests of the private well water quality in these uh, homes, and they found evidence, again, of, of poor water quality. Uh, at about 27% of the wells that were tested, microbial contaminants were found at levels above EPA's drinking water standards. Uh, there was excess in iron and manganese, which are mainly taste and odor problems. A lot of the homes had very low pH, which of course causes corrosion risks, and there was excess lead in, in about 9% of the homes, and that's obviously a very serious problem if you have young children in the home drinking the water. So we do have evidence of of uh, high rates of septic system failures and poor uh, water quality in these communities. But again, there's not been any systematic survey at the statewide level that would really allow um, the state health director and county health directors to really understand the magnitude of this problem. And again, that's the purpose of our research, to characterize these disparities. How many communities are affected? Where are they located? What risks do these communities face? And what can we do about this problem? You know, what's led to this problem and how can this problem be overcome? Um, so what I wanted to emphasize is that the scope of this research really is focusing on areas at the fringes of cities and towns where water service is available. This map I'm showing here, I'm going to refer to again later in the presentation. This is one uh, of the maps that my students and I have prepared representing a new data set. And this shows Wake County. So. Um, and in and the areas that are crosshatched are areas that are within municipal boundaries. The yellow lines define the territory in what's called extraterritorial territorial jurisdictions. Those are areas where the municipalities, the near, nearby municipalities and towns actually completely control land use decisions. But the people living there don't have rights to municipal services and they also don't have the rights to vote for town council. So the communities we highlight in red, they are within these extraterritorial jurisdictions. So the nearby cities and towns can control their, their land uses, but these people have no services from these nearby municipalities nor any right to vote. Those are the areas that we're really focusing on. That's where we really see this problem occurring. The areas in red are ones that have no municipal water service. And again, they're within these extraterritorial extraterritorial jurisdiction. So those are the communities that we're really focusing on because they're very close to municipal services. But, but again, they don't have access to those. I wanted to point out what we're not focusing on. This map here is one that my students and I prepared showing the percentage of people with community water service across the state in North Carolina, or excuse me, the percentage of people without. So the dark areas mean that more than 75% of the population has no access to municipal water service. And you can see that there's vast areas of North Carolina where basically nobody has municipal water service. In fact, in North Carolina, we have a very high rate of people without service. 22% of the population across the state has no community water service as compared to 8% nationwide. But we're really, for this project, again, we're focusing only on areas at the fringes of communities because these are areas where it really should be easy to establish connections at relatively low cost. So, so this issue of people who live in areas where nobody has service, that's going to be the topic we hope for a future study. Now, how are we going about looking at whether there are disparities in water service and sewer service in these fringe communities? Well, we're using 
publicly available data, but with a big caveat. We have to compile this in very new ways and using very laborious kind of labor-intensive processes. Um, basically, uh, what we're doing is we're using census block data to characterize the population in each census block, and we're doing this analysis census block by census block rather than at some higher resolution. However, the U.S. Census last asked people whether they had public water and sewer service in 1990. And so in order to get an update of that, after trying many different information sources, what we found, the only thing that really works is to go county by county to tax parcel data and record for each land parcel from the tax records whether those people have a private well uh, and a septic system or whether they are connected to a municipal system. So we have to code that parcel by parcel, and then code for each percentage, each census block, what percentage of, of the land parcels in that census block have access to services. So this has been really laborious, and I think a lot more challenging than what we had anticipated. So we're creating this great big new data set, and then we're going to use statistical methods to analyze the role of race in predicting access to water and sewer service in these fringe areas. Um, for the second objective, again, it's to characterize what would be the benefits of, of basically building uh, you know, water and sewer lines into these unserved communities. And the way we're going about this, there's three basic steps. One is we have access to a database of microbial water quality data collected from private wells around the state from our uh, Division of Public Health. Using that, we are going to characterize basically the risks of, of waterborne disease, microbial mediated diseases from private wells. Uh, we're gonna, we have the same information on chemical contaminants, so we're going to do the same. And then we've downloaded information on every community water system in the state from the EPA Safe Drinking Water Information System. And we're going to compare the risks of being on a private well to those health risks associated with the observed water quality at the nearest water supply system to each of these unserved census blocks. Um, and we're also going to, to look at the risks of just reliance on septic systems, and that for that we're going to use previous epidemiologic studies that showed elevated risks um, associated with high densities of septic systems. So I'm not going to talk too much about that today. For the third objective is which to figure out what could we do to solve this problem, we are conducting key informant interviews in different communities that are affected by this problem. Um, we tried to get three kinds of categories of communities. One community where there's no progress made in overcoming these disparities. One where sort of corrections are in process, policies to basically connect these communities to services are in discussion. And one that's actually successfully been connected to municipal services. So we have a discussion guide for each of these interviews. I don't really need to go over it, but basically, we have different kinds of key informants who are interviewing, and each one is asked a different set of questions, tended to, to elicit from them information about their, their knowledge of this problem and, and their ideas about potential solutions. Um, okay, with that, I'm going to give you some preliminary results, and, and this is really kind of late breaking. I'm pretty excited. So for Wake County, we've managed to completely map out using tax parcel records, very updated estimates of water service in each parcel. And what this map shows, this is the, the map of Wake County that I showed you before. Here the shaded areas are areas that are majority African American and have no water service and are in these fringe extraterritorial jurisdiction communities. So what we wanted to do then is, is compare the odds that the people living in these areas have community water service to the likelihood that people who are not in these majority African American communities have water service. And I'm just going to show you some preliminary results. Again, we needed to do some much more sophisticated analysis, but it's very interesting. What this chart shows, on the horizontal axis, it's the percentage of African American population in each census block in these fringe areas of Wake County. And on the, the first vertical axis on the left is the percentage of people without water service. So this is an interesting shaped curve. For areas that are basically all white, about 50% of people have water. Then for areas where there's more of a kind of a racial mix, more and more people get water until it's about greater than 25% African American, and then people start to lose water service up until 
for, for the areas that are 100% African American, about 67% of people don't have water. Um, so this is an, kind of an interesting trend. It, it seems that the really highly segregated neighborhoods, whether they're entirely African American or entirely white, have less water service than more mixed neighborhoods. Um, but the African Americans seem to be worse off than their all white neighbors. Also shown on this is median income. So when we do statistical analysis to look at the effect of race, we'll need to control for this. And of course, this area where more people have access to water service corresponds to areas with the highest median income. You'll see that the areas that are all African American or, or even more than 60% African American have extremely low household incomes, around $5,000 a year. Um, which is just astounding. So these areas are really poor, and it's very unlikely that any of these people can afford adequate maintenance on their wells and septic systems. The median income in the, the all-white communities is higher, about 25000 a year, although, again, I would question whether even those people can afford adequate maintenance. So that's an interesting finding, and it really uh, kind of gives us hope that this method that we're using to ferret out these communities is just going to work. Here's a preliminary result looking at comparing health risks in private wells with those of community water systems. We show here the type of system, private wells on the far left, type of system, uh, these are very small systems serving fewer than 500 uh, residences all the way up to very large systems, and this is cancer risk. And these are risks on a per, uh, cases per year per 100,000 people. So you'll see that private well owners actually, to my surprise, face a higher cancer risk than people on community water, and this risk is driven entirely by arsenic. We do have some arsenic belts in North Carolina. All right, almost done here. The key informant interviews, um, we don't really have anything to report from that because we've just completed all the interviews, completed transcribing them, and what we're doing is analyzing them using a qualitative software called Atlas TI that once all the interviews are transcribed is basically used to identify common themes and trends. So we expect to have some results by April. So the timeline for completing this is really we've only completed this sort of geocoding of who does and doesn't have water service and where these fringes are for a couple of counties. And so we need to complete that. And there's a big push we're making on that to get that done by early summer so that we can spend summer really doing statistical analysis to look at the role of race. Um, quantification of health benefits, we're waiting for a little bit more information from the Division of Public Health on the microbial quality information, um, but, but that's well underway. And we expect, the, based on the qualitative interviews, to have some results from that by April. And with that, I will wrap up and ask if anybody has any questions, I guess, before we turn it over to Jamie. Is there any immediate questions before we turn it over to Jamie for his comments? This, uh, this is Paul Irwin. Just thus far, uh, of the preliminary data that you showed, what's what's the in? What's the population number that you're that you've got? You mean what's the population number in the fringe areas? Right. That that for for whom you've report you're reporting yeah. these preliminary results so far. Good question. Okay. So what 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 you our real n is not it's the number of census blocks. And we have about 1,500 census blocks in these fringe areas in Wake County. And okay. the total population in those, I'd have to look at my, my, my data set again, but um, in the areas, I, I know the areas, there's about 450 people living just in areas that are 100% African American. And in the total population in these areas, in total is in the thousands to tens of thousands. Okay. Thank so, you. But, yeah. Okay. That's just for Wake County. Other questions? This is, this Other is questions? Anna from the Coordinating Center, and, and I do have um, <coughs> some next steps kinds of questions, uh, but it might be better uh, to, to wait and hold those until the end. Um, okay. So I'm, I'm going to to step back and wait on those just a couple moments. Okay. All right, that's fine, Anna. All right, Jamie, do you want to chime in and kind of uh, add your comments and suggestions and ideas to this to, to uh, the presentation? I've, got, I've, I've just got a few reflections. Um, I was looking over the, the data in this presentation uh, yesterday again, and I think there were there really 
four things that stand out to me. And uh, the first, I think, is is to give Jackie a degree of praise in front of others. I think this is a really interesting piece of work. I think it's you made a, an interesting comment in the introduction. It's an unfashionable area that's of great public health importance, uh, and it's really nice to see to see this moving ahead. Um, the second is that in this kind of area of enterprise, we see very few new data sets being generated that can actually be interrogated uh, extensively. Um, and what is absorbing a great deal of time at the moment is getting all that geocoded data into a useful format that can be used. And I think one of the things that Jackie had, didn't mention is that once that's done, those data are then available for, for other analyses as well. So I'm optimistic that this is a, a very um, valuable initial exercise that will give us the opportunity to interrogate other further interesting questions in the future. Uh, the third comment I had may be a little bit left field for some of the people on this call, but uh, I'm in the, the rather privileged position that I do some of my, my research here in the US, and I do some of it uh, internationally in developing countries. And in the, develop, in the development um, community, one of the um, issues that is attracting a, a huge amount of policy attention at present is that the world is actually improving really quite rapidly uh, in terms of drinking water and sanitation access to the extent that our new cycle of millennium development goals, the new development targets, will be focused not so much on just extending access but on understanding what are the populations that lack access, why do they lack access, and what are the ways in which we can extend access to them. And that's driven not only by these international development targets, but also by recognition in 2010 of a human right to water and, and, and sanitation. Now, the reason I mention that is that this kind of work that Jackie is driving ahead is really pathfinding work that helps us develop the kinds of tools that respond to those questions. And therefore, its policy and practice relevance extends far beyond the boundaries of the, U of the US. And I can see that this is the kind of thing that will be picked up elsewhere. It may sound odd to make parallels between the situation in North Carolina uh, and that in Kenya, for example. But I can see that these tools with appropriate adaptation have got really immediate relevance there also. And the last point then is a, is a very simple one. I think Jackie mentioned it, but it's worth belaboring. We've received uh, a great deal of interest in, in this question and the work um, from policy level within the state. So the former Director of Environment and Natural Resources, Dina, uh, is directly engaged in this. But we've also seen that interest from other adjacent states. So the policy relevance of, of this work is really high. And I look forward to seeing the insights into how do we improve the situation so that the assessment improvement combination is very clear in order that we can move, move from research into practical improvement measures. So they were my brief comments to try and uh, help Brick take the discussion ahead. Jamie, that, that's very important and very, very important. I, uh, <clears throat> I'm delighted that there are appears to be international implications for this. But I also think that uh, it's interesting that I think uh, many of the surrounding states in central Appalachia uh, share with North Carolina much of the same sorts of problems I know we do in Kentucky. And I think your work thinking about the policy implications coming from the key informant surveys are going to be very, very fascinating. And the extent to which uh, the policymakers uh, in a local context are aware of and uh, concerned about this particular issue. And I will be really fascinated to see the extent to which that is or is not the case, because I do think that has substantial implications uh, for, for policy, again, local policy makers, particularly the people who control the water districts, frankly. Uh, with that, let me open up again. Uh, to both Jamie and, and uh, uh, Jamie, to, uh, to any questions that anybody has uh, for either of our uh, colleagues, either the expert or, or our, uh, uh, our, our 
uh, research scientist, centered research scientist. It's open. Hi, this is Anna. I'm going to jump in now. <laughs> oh, go, go for it, Anna. First, I, I, I just have to tell you a brief story so that the people in the offices around me understand. Um, when you showed the picture of Pinehurst, I burst out laughing. And, and here's why. I work very closely with uh, Kentucky's Water Research Institute, and we've been doing a watershed, a stakeholder engaged watershed uh, project for nutrient management strategies in Greater Louisville. And uh, you may or may not know that Valhalla, which is also a, a PGA turn, uh, tournament course, um, is, is in a similar uh, type situation. And uh, we visited a number of very small um, package plants within a couple of miles of Valhalla, and there were dead deer everywhere. So uh, the site of another PGA course near, near uh, the, these issues uh, amused me in a sad way if that makes any sense. Um, but my primary question is, we ha now, now that you've generated this data, now, in, in addition to creating the tools, in addition to, to pursuing um, evidence-based policy, obviously, do you have other next steps you're thinking about in terms of disseminating, to the disseminating these findings to the communities affected, in terms of engaging those communities in some sort of uh, uh, change? Um, change-based work. There are a number of potential funding opportunities out there from, for example, NIHS has their Research to Action grants in assessing and addressing community exposures. Um, EPA has Environmental Justice Collaborative Problem Solving uh, Agreements program. So there are a number of, of ways of engaging the people living in these communities directly in addition to going the policy uh, route and addressing this from a multi-tier uh, approach. So I'm just wondering if you, when you're thinking through your dissemination um, and next steps, if, if you've thought of going that route at all. That is an excellent, excellent comment. And actually, we have very, not only thought about that, but we actually submitted a grant proposal to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Public Health Law Program for exactly such a project. It didn't <laughs> get funded, but we have at UNC a really terrific center for civil rights. And they actually provide legal representation to some of these communities. And so I've been over to meet with them several times. And um, we have that nice proposal written. And we will pursue other opportunities to get it funded through these other sources. We'll kind of look at what happened and how we can improve it. So yeah, through the C Center for Civil Rights, we have some really great connections with, with some of these communities. Another idea that we have is every year, the Water Institute here at UNC, um, of which Jamie's director, um, has a, a conference. And in fact, you should be uh, invited to the conference as well. It's, um, it's called Water and Health, Where Science Meets Policy. And it brings people not only from all over the US, but from all over the world. And uh, we are thinking that we might have a special session at the next conference, which will be next October, which would bring in policymakers from affected states to talk about this very issue. Um, we could have presentations with the results of this work. I have a colleague in um, West Virginia, I'm sorry, not in Virginia, doing some work in Appalachia. Um, so, so we can convene a special session at the, at the conference for October. And I'm very open to other ideas as well. Well, there's one that just came in, and that's, it, it's, it's a good one, I think. Uh, if I could suggest it to you all, and that, it's coming from Pam Russo. Pam, if you want to, to do it yourself, but uh, the, the notion of health impact assessments as, uh, as a mechanism for addressing some of the things you're finding out. Pam, you want to comment on that if you're on? You're just listening, Pam. Pam makes the comment that there's a, she's not on the phone. Says, uh, maybe you should consider having communities apply for the health impact impact assessment grants, which are coming out in, uh, in February. There, in fact, point of fact is uh, a call for proposals that will be forthcoming for health impact assessment grants, obviously from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, it sounds, uh, Jackie, like you may be able to recycle <laughs> the first one that they turned out at PHLR. <laughs> Other questions, comments? That's a great this is Anna, one last time I'll go away, but I, I just want to, so since this is a PHSSR funded project and this is a PHSSR call, 
um, I'd just like to urge you to um, make sure you're keeping the systems and services piece um, in, in your thinking as you're going forward with this project because I think what happens a lot with funders like uh, EPA and NIHS is it's very attractive to get the community groups involved and sometimes the missing link ends up being the public health department. Um, so I would urge you to make um, your North Carolina PBRN an active partner, your North Carolina Public Health PBRN an active partner uh, in, in pursuing future directions for this and, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks. It's a terrific suggestion and I've been doing some work with Sue Lynn Ledford who's the Wake County Health Director and so through her I think um, that, that would be a great avenue for engagement. So that's really terrific. Other other questions or comments? This is this is Glenn Mays, and again, I just want to join the um, uh, the praise for this this work. I think um, uh, it, it's important work you've made. Um, really, some remarkable progress on a challenging uh, topic. Um, the, the the novel data sources here, some of the um, the methods that are being used, very very exciting. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I have an interest in. Um, uh, thinking a little bit more carefully about, again, along the lines of some of the policy implications here, and particularly thinking about the, the kind of the, the political economy that is operating in these areas that you've identified that are kind of disenfranchised from the the municipality, uh, and that being obviously one of the one of the mechanisms that are that, that's resulting in the um, you know in the underservice here. Uh, I wonder if you could you know, talk a little bit more about. Um, uh, any any work you might be considering or planning to do around exploring uh, in greater detail some of the policy mechanisms that might be causing this problem, uh, and also exploring some of the the, the, the policy mechanisms that might be um, be mobilized to generate solutions. And, and one of them that I'm thinking about perhaps relates to um, this is a uh, an institution that we study a lot in the PHSR field, and that is the, the governance structure, the public health governance structures that exist. Uh, in these areas in North Carolina, I think these are county boards of health that mostly operate and, and, that, and that, that are charged to some extent with having responsibility for for these issues uh, within the larger uh, county-based jurisdiction. So I'm wondering whether you thought about specifically whether county-level boards of health might be a mechanism for, for generating some action um, uh, around these issues. That's an excellent, excellent comment. And you're right, it's local politics, often in the smaller communities, that has kind of led to this situation in the first place, with communities purposely drawing their boundaries to exclude, you know, these, these uh, African Americans from, from services. Um, and we haven't thought about engaging um, um, boards of public health. The one comment I'll make on that is that one of the reasons we don't know where all these communities are and that we're having to go through this, you know, tax record process of identifying them, historically communities have been afraid to come forward because if their failing septic system is found, they can be fined thousands of dollars and what's even happened in some cases is property has been condemned. So people have actually lost their property. So in a lot of these communities there is a great fear of the public health department. And perhaps one policy solution might be to, um, you know, give these people protection so they don't lose their land. Um, and there's some funding source that they can use um, if they're not going to be connected to community services, at least to, um, you know, fix failing septic systems. So, but yeah, that's a really good good comment. Maybe those some people from the uh, local boards of health could be invited to to our conference and I discuss these issues. I would encourage that. And frequently, there's an overlap between things like the water board and the county board of uh, supervisors, or whatever you call the county council, and uh, the local boards of health. And then many times, those are kind of interlocking boards. And I, I would think, again, following on Gillen's suggestion, some look at kind of the uh, regulatory and advisory structure, if you will, for some of that in, in uh, your situation would be incredibly interesting. Uh, this this is Paul Irwin again. Just uh, um, this is more of a question out of curiosity than anything else. Um, but you you commented on. Uh, I'm, well, I'm, I'm I am just curious about the the uh, lack of availability of of. Um, 
of data in your need to geocode um, uh, something so detailed as this. So do, do county health departments in North Carolina not um, issue uh, septic permits or do they not um, do perk test uh, or or um, uh, well permits yeah that's a really good question I, I need to look more into the policy on that but I believe that the well permitting process was really changed beginning about 2007 and that was the first time that uh, well water quality testing actually became mandatory and there you know, our septic system licensing programs, but a lot of these septic systems are unlicensed. And again, people are afraid to come forward because uh -huh. if they do, their property could be condemned or they could be fined. There's a lot of history here of very marginal populations. Um, yeah. yeah. For historic reasons, have acted uh, on the margins of formality, um, and therefore those things are not in place. And hence the fear that Jackie's referring to. It's a very real issue. It would be really fascinating for you guys to reach out to your public affairs uh, colleagues at the School of Public Affairs around this issue because it, it so much is a governance issue around permitting and, and perk tests and uh, septic tanks. As I said at the outset, I, I think everybody, every one of us who's ever worked in a health department has had an angry developer in our office ready to strangle us because we wouldn't let them put 20 more houses on a piece of property because of the uh, of the perk tests. So, uh, Absolutely. You know, it's just it's a very political environment in which you operate, as you're well aware. And that's a ma major issue here, where small small towns, uh, former mill towns, are trying to to develop. And exactly what you've just described, the soil won't won't take the rate the perk rates that people want. There is not the money available to install more sophisticated um, sewage systems. Um, but that's seen as a major constraint on development and local economy and economic transformation. Exactly right. And I, you know, that's, I guess it raises the other point that Glenn, I think, was pointing out. And that's, uh, my guess is some of your econometric friends might be interested in some of the economics surrounding some of these issues as well. I, you know, I just can't imagine that there's not uh, some interesting economic analysis could be done around that, this particular issue. But the other comment I would make is that I would guess that, it, well, I know that in many places the environmental responsibility has been removed from the health department and invested in some other unit in state government. And that unit frequently is not as concerned with human health as they are about the environmental degradation, not that those are necessarily mutually exclusive, but certainly another uh, uh, wiggle, another worm in the, in the can that you guys have opened. Mm-hmm. Well, these are really helpful comments, um, and we do have a really great econometrician in our public policy department, so it might be good for me to engage him if, in a future proposal as well. I would love that. I think it would be wonderful, Jackie, if you did that. Other questions for, for or comments from people? Just a very specific question that, that I had and, and um, kind of relates to the question that, uh, that Paul Irwin asked earlier, just about the data resources. Um, it, it's great to hear about the, um, the, the existing data you found in terms of uh, well water data quality that exists at the State Health Department. We've, um, we've had a, a project underway through our PBRNs that has involved um, uh, developing uh, standard measures that be, can be collected at a local level across uh, multiple states looking at uh, uh, measures of public health um, delivery and public health quality and uh, we spent some time looking at uh, looking specifically in the water um, uh, domain and, and we're coming up with a lot of uh, blanks in terms of uh, existing data sources that were common across states that could support some common measurement approaches um, uh, and so uh, I was uh, intrigued to hear that the, the private well water quality is, is available uh, statewide, apparently in North Carolina, do you have a sense of whether uh, of how how common that is, uh, how prevalent that that uh, data source might be across other states, and uh, great could question. this be an opportunity? Yeah, yeah great. go ahead. Sorry. There's, there's a big caveat on that data set, which is that it, people were only required to test wells for wells constructed beginning in 2007, 
So these Bam. legacy ones, all <laughs> testing was voluntary up till that point. So I really don't know the extent to which other states collect this information. In North Carolina, we have data going back to 98, but again, all testing was voluntary prior to 07. Just building on that, one of my, my sidebar activities, something called America's Health Rankings, and we consistently struggle in the steering, steering group for that to find the kind of um, universal data, set, data sets where we have something we can collect across um, all states. On the water quality side, one of the few things is the EPA database for, school, for schools, but even that is very incomplete. Well, let me, uh, <coughs> let me say congratulations, Jackie and Jamie. I think this has been an absolutely incredible kickoff. Uh, I'm just delighted with, uh, with the presentation and where you guys are. It's obvious that uh, you're doing some really cutting edge stuff and that has uh, implications, I think, for, uh, for a lot of us. And I, I really do appreciate your being the lead in this particular activity. Uh, we obviously stand prepared to help you in any way we can, and I appreciate very much the participation of folks on the call and the conversation, and we'll look forward to the next call, which will be coming up uh, fairly soon, uh, and hope uh, uh, Jamie, you, and Jackie will be on those calls to be able to share your thoughts with, uh, with your colleagues uh, uh, who are other mentored research scientists, and we are looking forward to your presentation at Keeneland, and uh, please keep up the good work because it is, as I say, quite exciting. With that, if there are no other questions or comments, uh, I will uh, take the opportunity to sign off and say thanks again to everyone for your participation in this, and look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.